Okay, so second day of advance, fourth day of the workshop in a row, sunny day, let's go. So uh, today, uh, this morning, we're going to obviously talk about uh, metagenomic functional annotation. This has come up, you know, a couple of little times in the past, but we'll try to get through uh, a bit more of a deep dive on it. As, as always, feel free to ask questions. And then, of course, later on this afternoon, we're going to get into more statistics, a little bit of machine learning. We're just going to push the envelope a little bit there, there for, for us and you, <laughs> because we've never tried to teach that before. But uh, yeah, we're going to focus on functional. Uh, uh, we go. Okay, so by the end of this lecture, hopefully you can appreciate the major, major challenges and functional annotation of uh, metagenomic data. Know the main steps in uh, functional annotation. Uh, we'll contrast a few functional databases and functional annotation systems. We're going to take a little bit of a dive <clears throat> into the tool called Human, mostly just as, a, as an example, I guess, of an annotation system, and also because it's kind of popular. And we'll talk a little bit about what stratified functional output is and why it might be important for biological interpretation. Okay, so up to this point, really, most of the uh, workshop has been focused on taxonomy, right? Talking about the species are in a particular sample, whether you're profiling them with 6 ns or metagenomics. And we've talked about this idea of obviously also getting at the information about what are they doing. And basically, metagenomics provides the opportunity to catalog the set of genes from entire community uh, and compare those differences across samples. So what do we actually mean sort of here by function, right? Uh, so we could be wanting to kind of, uh, sort of have general characteristics uh, as high level as like, hey, you know, does this community do more photosynthesis? Do they do more nitrogen metabolism or glycolysis? Or it could be down to the level of really a specific gene, a specific gene being different between uh, a group of organisms. So that could be NIFH, which is involved in uh, nitrogen fixation, uh, you'll see different types of genes, depending on what gene catalog they're in, and we'll talk about those more. So EC 1.1.1.1 is from the enzyme classification system, and it stands for alcohol dehydrogenase. Uh, and then the last example there is uh, a keg ortholog, which we'll talk about in detail a little bit as well. Uh, not this specific keg ortholog, just the system. Uh, standing for butyrate kinase, right? But we can think about, you know, clusters of genes essentially, and then categorizing differences across those. We can then collapse those genes into sort of modules and pathways all the way up to really sort of general, general function. Okay, so uh, I'd like to sort of always bring up the challenges before we dive, in, dive into like how, you know, why um, the approach we're gonna take. So if you've ever thought about genome annotation, which you may not have, uh, there's some challenges there just with genome annotation about unknown genes, finding homologies if it's distant, um, you know, problems if a gene is short and another one's long, determining whether one is really the homologue of another. But on top of that, we basically layer all those challenges with additional challenges with metagenomic data. So because we don't usually have um, the whole genome, unless, of course, we're talking about mags yesterday, where maybe you have most of the whole genome, we're often dealing with partial gene fragments. So instead of searching for a whole gene, you're searching sort of for a part of a read. So that's problematic. We're annotating very broad microbial groups. So if you're, you know, annotating a particular bacterial genome, you would have kind of a sense of what's in it, and you'd try to compare it to similar genomes. Because of this, we're spanning lots of different bacterial genomes, which means we kind of have to have larger databases. But if you're interested in trying to capture things about microbial eukaryotes or even viruses, well, then that gets broader and even a bit more difficult. Um, and then again, we come back to this idea of computationally, it's hard. There's a lot of data. Uh, and as we'll see, if we want to have a bit more sensitivity in how we're searching for genes, uh, that makes things a little bit slower. Uh, and so speed and scalability are very important. Uh, and then we have to think a little bit about biases that may arise from our data. Uh, so unequal sequencing depth may be a bias. Gene length may be a bias. And we'll talk about those a bit more detail. 
And uh, the fun idea of if we are interested in collapsing genes into modules or pathways, the difficulty of doing that, if we're thinking about the fact that we don't know what genes came from which organisms and whether we really want to try to collapse them into pathways when they're not in the same cell. Okay, so what's the sort of key major steps of a functional annotation pipeline? One is the choice of similarity search uh, algorithm. So before we've talked about uh, bow tie or BWA. And if you remember, I referred to those as sort of like DNA mappers. They're very fast, especially at high percent identities. They are searching in nucleotide space. Uh, and as I mentioned, they have to have a fairly high similarity to detect them. So because we're often searching for genes that are proteins, uh, we get a lot more sensitivity if we search in, pro in protein space, and we also get uh, more, we want to detect essentially more distant homologs, right? It's not just about finding a 99% similar gene so that we can call a particular taxa, even if it's our top hit is maybe 80% amino acid similarity, that's enough to sign functional annotation to, to those reads, or even lower, like 50% or even 30%. <laughs> okay, so that's that's one choice, sort of how we how we do that. The second, obviously, is the database we choose um, and whether we go for a much larger database that's comprehensive and will hopefully annotate a larger proportion of the sequences that we're searching or whether we're, maybe we don't want something comprehensive. Maybe we don't actually care about sort of characterizing every possible function. We just, we're going after certain um, types of functions, antimicrobial resistance or carbohydrate metabolizing enzymes. And really, you know, uh, the pipeline is kind of almost similar or a simpler, sorry, than taxonomic annotation. It's, it's really those first two, two spots, those first two steps, sorry. And then that will lead to, you know, being able to come up with a table of, of, of functions by, by samples. There is some steps after that. Many we'll see are sort of um, sometimes optional, not optional, yeah, optional. Essentially, some people will do them, sometimes they won't. And they take into account whether you're trying to normalize for different factors, which we'll talk about, uh, or whether you're trying to do essentially uh, pathways and gap filling or removing spurious pathways, which we'll talk about in more detail. So there's sometimes basically steps afterwards that you know try to correct for those. Okay, so we'll be focusing on that first step of the search algorithm um, and what tool you should use for that. This is a neat little, I think it's a little neat because it's kind of computer science-y. Um, this is a paper from 2017, a little caveat that this is from the MM6 uh, authors. So you always have to take that with a bit of a grain of salt, but very cool. And so what we see on the left essentially is a table of different uh, search algorithms in protein space. So when they say BLAST here, they actually mean BLAST X uh, versus a whole bunch of other different tools. And you'll see some of the tools repeated depending on um, their, their um, uh, options, essentially. So you can have MMSeqs where it's sensitive, essentially where it's trading off more sensitivity for speed all the way up to faster. And you can see, obviously, the huge speed up that can occur with some of these algorithms. So obviously, if we did BLAST, this would be a one. Um, you've probably heard of Diamond. It's very popular. So that's already 4,000 times faster than a BLAST X search. So uh, you can imagine that's going to find things a lot better. Uh, and then we see MM Seeks here as well, up to a point of you know 100,000 times faster than a BLAST search. Uh, and then really, this is just getting up that there's always a trade-off often between speed and sensitivity. And this is just uh, illustrating essentially that trade-off. So we have the speed up on a log scale here. So that's important to note. And then we have essentially their measurement of accuracy in this in this figure, in this paper, sorry. And so what we see is, you know, depending on what you want, you could go very fast, losing some sensitivity all the way to over here. Uh, along this diagonal, essentially. So up here is obviously ideal, but we're hitting some sort of limit here. Uh, and there's always going to be a bit of a trade-off, essentially, between speed and, and sensitivity. And when I say sensitivity, 
basically it's your ability to accurately identify something in your database, right? So essentially a loss of sensitivity is that you would not be able to detect something, especially at lower amino acid identities. So some of these you might've heard, uh, RAP search was popular for a while, UBLAST, uh, but really I would say the two, I guess that you'll see often used is diamond and MM seeks in the, in the microbiome field. And this is essentially why. Okay, so let's just talk about general functional databases. So there's quite a few here. I'll go just step through them a little bit. Uh, so COG is a well-known original classification system. It's still actually used every once in a while, uh, mostly because you can find mappings to COG. And it's, I think people use it because it's a nice um, sort of sometimes a simple way to classify functions into these COG categories. You can get them to the point where they're fairly general things. And sometimes that's nice for, um, for a paper that you're trying to describe. I put not updated since 2003. That's a long time ago, just meaning that they haven't sort of added new types of functional groups to it. Basically, the mapping is the same and people continue to add mappings to it, but like the, the COG classification hasn't changed. Seed was um, pretty popular for a little while and I feel like it's uh, maybe not as popular as it was. Maybe, maybe it's just me, uh, but they were used by two, my, two major uh, systems called MGRAST and RAS. So RAS was a genome-based uh, annotation system and MGRAST is metagenomic annotation system. You could upload your data to MGRAST and it would be uh, functionally characterized with a seed system. If you've ever seen seen uh, subsystems, they're often from the seed system. Um, and so it's it's good, but I would say maybe not as popular as, uh, as some of the other methods. PFAM uh, is, stands mostly, uh, is more focused on protein domains. So they do have full length genes, uh, but really they focus on domains of proteins. If you've ever done like a blast search or anything basic like that, often you'll get like blast hits. Plus you can find a domain, which is just a, you know, a, a chunk of a gene, a smaller piece. Uh, and obviously PFAMs or domains can be shared a lot more across different types of genes. So if you have a common um, protein domain, doesn't necessarily mean that your proteins are doing the same thing. It just means that they may have, you know, some aspect to it that's similar. So zinc finger domain or something, and then you're thinking about, oh, maybe it binds to DNA. So the more popular ones I would say nowadays is the, is the next few. Uh, one is UNRF. And so I would classify this as probably one of the most comprehensive uh, functional databases. And the reason for it is because essentially they take a systematic approach where they try to take, you know, all the proteins from all reference genomes and then routinely cluster them like at a particular amino acid identity. They don't care about trying to uh, precisely put things into different ortholog groups or groups of genes. Uh, and they basically do that at different amino acid identities. So at UNREF 100, it is at 100% identity. So they just collapse them at 100%. UNREF 90 is at 90% and UNREF 50 is at 50%. So depending on how sort of precise you want, you could choose the database. You can imagine that UNREF 100 would obviously be a lot larger than UNREF 90 or 50. Uh, UNREF 50 would be a lot smaller, but obviously then you're collapsing, you know, possibly different genes. Uh, it seems like the, the trade-off often is around, I see a lot of people use UNREF 90. Uh, and I, th I think there's actually like other cutoffs between 90 and 50, but, but you can imagine uh, just choosing one of those. But usually because the size of UNREF 100 is so large, people often don't go for that one. So that's nice. Um, so one, I guess the idea is if you do this mapping, you have a greater chance of mapping your reads to something. And then the other nice thing about the system is essentially by default, they may not give you a gene name or um, some sort of descriptive name of the gene. It would just have a UNREF ID, but they provide mappings from those IDs to other systems. So essentially it's a good starting point for your search. And then you say, okay, now I can map UNREF 90 
to PFAMs, or as we'll see in the next stage, like CAG or Metapsych. So it's a really good starting point. It basically gets the comprehensive part, and then you can map things after. Many of those IDs won't map to something descriptive. You'll just end up still having an ID for the, for the protein, but at least you have found something. So the next two, I guess, are still very popular. Uh, so KEG um, was very popular for a long time, and it still is. It's sort of still holding on a bit. Um, it was probably the one of the first databases that really focused on this idea of genes and putting them into essentially, you know, more complex networks that are biologically meaningful. So KEGs will map to pump modules, as we'll see, or KEG pathways. It gives you a very nice description about them. Uh, including graphically, like what the pathway looks like and what genes are involved. They did go private many, many years ago. And so much of it's sort of public facing, but uh, sort of to get more updates, you would require a license fee. So that's a bit of a, a bit of a turnoff for some. Uh, and then uh, along came Metapsych, although Metapsych is really well established well now as well. And so you can, in my head, I sort of equate Metapsych or KEG uh, is sort of very similar, but different. <laughs> Private, I don't know if they're like, you can do a couple of researches, but then they want you to pay for a subscription if you want to even look at your data. Whereas K, you can just put it in there and at least play around. Really? Yeah. Yeah, Metasic and Biosic, it's, they want like a thousand dollar subscription to even analyze your data. I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> I will update my slides. Um, yeah, so uh, that's unfortunate. So Metapsych obviously was nice because it was the free alternative. Um, yeah, so what then happens, I guess, is that people will develop uh, annotation systems. Uh, they'll essentially take mappings from somewhere at some point, like the UNREF to KEG or UNREF to Metapsych, and then essentially try to use that mapping in the background. But then obviously, you're a bit limited on then what you can extract. Like if you're interested in a particular functional pathway, if you have to go to the database, obviously if it's privatized, well then that's a bit limiting. So yeah. Yeah, so there's still essentially tools and and as far as I know, Keg and Metasite both let you still do this, you know, in the back end, essentially the mapping. And so you'll get the pathways, but yeah, their greater suite of tools, including the most updated functions, essentially is, is under license. But thanks for that. Um, I decided to add these back in, uh, uh, mostly because I think it's useful for just thinking about um, genes are mapped in the pathways a little bit. So this is the keg example. So um, this is just an example of a particular keg ortholog um, at the, I'd say 12,000 here. I mean, this varies depending on sort of where you get your mapping from. It, it could definitely be more now. Uh, and then if you do go to the keg database, you can look it up. You find the keg ortholog ID, you get a name, a longer definition of what that is. And then you get information about what pathways and modules this gene is in. So this is an, like a, an important concept. Obviously, one gene can be mapped to multiple modules or pathways. You also get interesting information about um, uh, these pathways can then get mapped into these larger uh, systems, essentially, that are a bit more general. And so you can keep collapsing them up to get to some, some you know, general category, including something as general as like carbohydrate metabolism, right? Uh, this is probably a good point to note here a little bit. See this disease fun factor here. Uh, sometimes, obviously, genes overlap uh, between microbes and, and humans. Like there's actually homology, right? And so because of that, you will see sometimes uh, genes associated with the disease in some of these functional databases. And it's not because the gene is in the microbe causing that disease. It's because the gene is in humans and has been associated with the disease. So, yeah, you just want to watch out for that. It'd be cool if we get to the point where we have a functional database, you know, where the gene and the microbes is associated with disease. But right now that doesn't exist beyond, obviously, if it was describing like a pathogenicity factor, but that's definitely not what Keg is describing here. 
virulence. It does do virulence genes, but like it wouldn't usually be under disease as far as I know. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay, so that's great. So then they can link these into other systems. Uh, no, so then for KEG, they have these modules. So you can sort of think of as this is the next step up. Um, and so these are thought to be functional units. Uh, there's obviously less of them. So about 750 KEG modules. What's kind of cool about this is with KEG modules, it's, it's not just a bag of genes. They actually organize them into these modules to say whether they're actually complete or not. So this little diagram on the right actually shows what's kind of necessary to say that this module exists in a genome. And what I mean by that is that you have to essentially have a path through this for the module be, to be complete. So no matter what, you would need this keg ortholog, then you would need either this keg ortholog or one of these and one of these, one of these four, Definitely this one and one of these two. Pretty cool stuff. Um, and then that's actually what this is, is represented as textually over here on the left. Um, so it's kind of nice because then it's like, you can really say whether this module is complete or not. Um, bioinformatically, it makes a bit of a nightmare on the back end of trying to compute these, um, but they, they do have a system for that. Yeah. Yeah. The thing on the right? Yes, sorry. So what I mean is if you can imagine, it's easier to think about this in a single genome, and you would want to say whether this, this functional unit exists within this organism. And what they're saying here is that to decide if a keg module exists, you basically have to have a path through this graph from start to finish. And so what I mean is that you can think of each of these as almost like a step in that module. And in the, yes, in that module. So at this level, you only have this choice. And then essentially you have to go down here and you could just have this gene, which kind of skips over this, this route almost, or you have to have one of these and this one. Then you got down to sort of this level, and then you could have any one of these genes to satisfy it. Yeah. Going on, going on. Okay. Like modules that you got, like you have to have each of these, or like you have to go through the path here, you have to have like each of these genes, et cetera, in order for this function to be in this organism. Absolutely. Okay. And then like for this module, which is a very basic module, it's glycolysis involving a three carbon compound, right? So because biologically, you know, for a genome, if we're thinking about the perfect case scenario and we've described everything well, caveat, 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 <laughs> we then define this function as existing, knowing that we have to have every one of these genes present. Could they be missing genes in the pathway though? And then other bacteria in the same environment can fill those parts? Yes, yes. So the problem here a little bit then is once we get into things that aren't as well characterized, you know, maybe obviously we haven't described all the functions of genes at all. <laughs> and so there definitely could be a new gene that's not described by a cake ortholog here that fulfills this function, one of these, one of these steps, right? There are like with glucose metabolism, not all bacteria can remove glucose in the host protein, but most bacteria can consume the glucose. So some bacteria would have the whole pathway, other ones would just have chunks of it, but they could still utilize the pathway, right? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, it's one cool thing about modules, but I guess one a bit limiting factor as well is, is maybe they're a bit too restrictive. So then the other, the other one that we would look at is in this particular case, keg pathways. And again, uh, many of these things go similar to say Metapsych. Metapsych has pathways as well and they don't call them modules. I'm blanking a little bit on what they call their smaller groups, but anyway, they do. Uh, and then these pathways can be quite large at times or smaller. Uh, and this is just obviously a large graph. You may have seen these before. Uh, and then this is actually highlighting a few genes that you've identified within this pathway. So say if you've mapped reads to genes, you could then actually look for representation of your genes in this in this pathway. And previously, I'd have to check recently, 
uh, you know, Keg would provide a nice way to, you know, make these pretty graphs, which are nice for talks because people like to talk about metabolism and then they're like, they highlight, you know, we have these genes, but maybe we don't. Um, but you can imagine still like at a genome level, this works pretty good. At a metagenome level with multiple species, uh, it's going to get a little bit more complicated because maybe you don't have all the genes in the pathway. Maybe different species are contributing genes to this pathway. Uh, but essentially, this is this is where we're at. Uh, and then these cake pathways can be collapsed into, uh, as I mentioned earlier, even more general functional terms like amino acid metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism, things like that. Does that make sense about sort of how we can collapse genes into higher higher systems? Keg pathways is not like modules. There's no set system per se. We often just treat them as what we would call a, a, like a bag of genes thing, right? So you just annotate them to it and you say, okay, I have this many genes. Obviously we could look at the pathway and see, you know, how well we've covered it, but there's not actually internally a representation of what you need to fulfill it per se. Uh, and I would say this coverage idea, some people do it, um, but because it's often with metagenomic data incomplete, it's it's hard to know when something's covered completely or just not because we haven't sequenced enough. Do, 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 do. Okay, so this is kind of what I was just talking about. Um, so a KO um, or an EC, so I should mention, I guess, with Metapsych, the starting point often for those is an EC number. Just another system and stands for that enzyme classification system with the numbers dot, dot, dot. The general idea is similar though, right? You're building up genes in some sort of gene family to pathways. So the problem is a little bit with this, as I alluded to, is uh, just because we've you know found a gene, right? And that gene is sometimes mapped to multiple types of modules or pathways. It doesn't necessarily mean that all those pathways exist. So if you start to then count them up across like a community or something, you know, how do you decide what pathways are there or not? In a single genome, you, you know, you could be like, okay, at least 60% of the pathway has to be there because you've sequenced all of it, right? Or something. So say you have a pathway with only 20 genes, with 20 genes, and you, you observe two of those genes in the community, you could count that pathway as two. Like by default, you would just do that. And the, the number doesn't really mean anything. You could just use that as a scaling factor. But I think most people would agree that maybe if you only have two out of the 20 genes of a pathway, we probably shouldn't report that as, as being there or, or counting it. But of course, then it gets complicated, right? <laughs> so what about 10? What about 15? So there's this tool called MinPath. It's been around for a long time. And the idea with MinPath essentially is to remove those spurious hits. So you've done all this mapping, all your pathways. And in MinPath, would say this um, minimum, essentially, path of genes to their pathways removes all these other spurious hits and sort of optimizes this as, as best it can. And then other tools will incorporate MinPath into their own sort of system. And then they'll add in maybe even other steps where they say, well, maybe we should add in genes that we you know, we think is there because the step before and after, and maybe just don't have sequencing depth. And this is where it gets into sort of like the basic step of finding the gene. And then the pathway mapping is, is a definitely a bit more of an art per se. So essentially what it means is when you have your functional annotation system, if you're looking at the bare bone genes, it's very easy to understand how that number usually equates to your reads. Read maps to gene, that's a count. But when you're looking at pathways, Depending on your system, it's not quite as interpretive. Also means that if you've found an interesting pathway in your data, often you want to go back and you say, okay, well, now I want to look at this keg pathway and see what actual genes maybe are driving that difference in the pathway. And that's when you see it's really messy. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, no, it's mostly just this gene. It's not really this pathway or, or, or something that's gone a little bit, not wonky, but it's just, it's hidden a bit from you. It's not often as clean as saying, oh, this pathway is really different. It, it's much more complex. Yeah, uh, there's a question here or here. No, no. Yeah. I was just going to say, so, uh, so 
uh, with that data, a lot of times it would be in point data, then, right? You'd look at that and that would give you a better idea of what you could hone in on with something like RTQ data. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it's good. I think it's good to get to the pathways and describe it. I think it's cool if you want to go back and try to map it to the individual genes to sort of, it gives you an idea of really, to me anyway, like why there really is that pathway that's really different, right? You see a whole bunch of genes differently um, abundant between two groups. You're like, oh, that does look really cool. If it's only one gene, maybe it's a bit misleading. Maybe it's not that pathway at all. Maybe it, you know, min pass at a crap job or whatever. And you could be misled before you start going into your big experiments, right? You might want to, you know, try to dive into it as much as possible so you're not misled by that. So you've basically done mapping of genes to to pathways, and then you've decided on these these numbers essentially. Uh, and then that's the question of do I have to do any sort of other normalization methods, normalization or scaling uh, essentially? And so there's a there's a few here, and we'll, we'll talk about them. So the I think the most obvious one here is that often people will try to scale those numbers, accounting for the size of the gene family that there's that they've hit. And this is quite easy to think about, I, I think. Uh, so basically, the idea is if you have a large gene, we're counting genes as as units, right? So if we have a large gene, the probability of hitting a large gene with a read when we sequence is higher than a small gene. Right. So if the gene is, you know, a thousand base pairs, and then this other gene is 500 base pairs, we would, and we're randomly sequencing, well, then we would expect to basically double count the thousand base pair gene compared to the smaller one. So essentially, what they'll do is they'll take those numbers, they know what gene family hit, they know the length of the real gene, and then they'll just simply divide those counts by the length of that gene. So now you're sort of normalizing for, for gene length. That makes sense to everyone. I would say that's to me a, a pretty good bare minimum. You know, um, again, not everyone would do it. Does it really matter? May, maybe not, <laughs> but I think it's probably a good idea. Uh, and then, uh, okay, so then, sorry, often then those um, normalized gene annotations are reported often as sometimes RPKM, which is just reads per kilobase per million of sequencing. So sometimes you'll see that terminology within a microbiome experiment, and all they're doing is normalizing uh, per thousand uh, kilobase, and then they're often scaling it to, to a million so you don't have super tiny numbers. All right, then the next one I want to talk about one is sequencing depth. So this is the most thorny one, probably. We talked a lot about sequencing depth back in the 16S one. Uh, if you weren't there for that, obviously this is the idea of if you've done different amounts of sequencing per sample, that is pretty arbitrary. And the idea would be to, you know, should we normalize a bit for that sequencing depth? And this varies uh, way more. So with 6NS, basically, yes, we need to normalize by sequencing depth, either by rarefaction or by um, some sort of transformation like CLR. With sequencing data for metagenomic data, we see everything from nothing, which I would say. I would say is almost the most popular <laughs> through to uh, rare faction. And again, maybe some sort of uh, transformation as a, as a, as an, another alternative. The argument I think people may make for not doing anything is that often with metagenomic data and the sequencing depth, the difference in sequencing depth across samples isn't quite as great as you would see with say Amplicon data. So Amplicon data, you can get quite a bit of variation from maybe, you know, 1,000, 10,000 sequences to 50,000. If we go to metagenomics, you just, you don't see like that full difference change. And that's about the only argument <laughs> that I can see, you know, to be like, well, it's not that much, so we don't bother. Um, do I have a recommendation in this area? I, I, I sort of don't. You know, I, I in my personal, yes, Monica. Are yeah. there any, like, Big arguments why you wouldn't carry out a CLR transformation on metagenomic data. I don't. I don't think so. I. No, there's there's a real lack of discussion around it. Considering how much discussion went in the 16s, you know, with people battling back and forth, metagenomics seems to be quite silent. Like I googled this yesterday, 
And then I found an old thread, email thread, where I was discussing it from 2017. So I reread my response. It was insightful. <laughs> <laughs> but not like, there's not much discussion since then, uh, amazingly. So did you see that people are a little scared to post too many holes in the process? Because then it's like, can we really have faith in anything that's coming out of it? Really oh, yeah. It? Yeah, I mean. Because what we have, when we have it, when it's better, we'll be with something better. <laughs> I, I, I agree with that completely. It, it's <laughs> Of all the issues, I always say this, of all the issues, it's like, yeah, I put this one down a little bit lower, right? You know? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I, I definitely think people don't like the idea of rarefaction microbiome metagenomic data that much, because then, especially for functional stuff, it's just like a lot, it feels like more data you're throwing away somewhat. Uh, but yeah, you'll see people do do transformations with like CLR. Uh, the next one I, I almost took out, uh, accounting for genome size or actually accounting for average genome size in a sample. This one is really hard to get your head around. And even myself, I always start to break my mind a little bit. Um, so there's a tool called Microbe, uh, Microbe, Microbe Census. I should have put that in the slide, sorry, um, from Katie Pollard group. Uh, but the idea, if I can describe this, is imagine you have a sample where most of the microbes have a fairly large genome. So the average genome size is quite large, especially if you're thinking about environmental samples. And then your other samples are from a different type of maybe environment, because that's what I think about of genome size, with smaller genome sizes on average. You can essentially get a bias in that Basically, the counting of genes, if you think about core genes especially maybe, is maybe the easiest one. If you count core genes within an average genome size that's larger, then it'll look like a smaller count. So you could have the same amount of um, core genes in both of these types of samples, but because the average genome size is larger, it looks like a smaller proportion of the total amount. I didn't do a bad job with that, considering no graphics. <laughs> um, again, I wouldn't say it's the most used normalization out there. It's an interesting paper. I would check it out, and I'll put it in the Slack after, so you can take a look at it. Um, I wouldn't say it's routinely used. It does make sense. Again, it's one of those worries maybe down the list of things to worry about uh, for normalization, but it, it exists. It's out there. It also, I think mostly because unless you're really doing things where average genome size is vastly different, then it's it's really not an issue, right? And I would say in most cases, people are comparing very similar environments where I think average genome size would be quite similar anyway. People often nowadays aren't comparing, you know, soil samples versus, um, you know, endosymbionts or something, but it is exists. Uh, and then the other thing is sometimes there's a scaling factor applied. So literally just when they say scaling factor, they just mean literally multiplying because they've divided so many things by so many things by some larger number. So you're not just dealing with like 0 0.0001 counts of something. Sometimes you will see them, like if it's RPKM, obviously that's scaled. And so it looks like counts. You start to get this false sense that maybe it's equated to read depth, like actual read counts. But of course it's been manipulated a lot. Or you will see them scale to like one, right? To a relative abundance and you will see a, a decimal. Uh, it just depends on the system. Okay, sorry. So that, does that make sense? That's a lot of stuff going on there. Good, good. Okay, great. So that's um, essentially, you know, you know, if you're thinking about building your own system, all that stuff would come into it. And it could be quite system, bare bone, all the way to quite complex with lots of normalizations. Uh, obviously this animation didn't come up the way I wanted. So I'll just do that. Um, so if we talk about metagenomic annotation systems, we'll start with maybe uh, systems where you just load your data up into a web browser and you get back data. Those do exist. Uh, often these are also usually tied with databases that host the data. So example is Magnify, which comes from the EBI metagenomic server. So EBI is a large sequencing group in Europe. And so you can basically host your data there and then they'll actually, you know, do some annotation on it, including tax and function and give you back reports. MGRAS is similar. Upload data, gives you back reports, no bioinformatic training needed really. 
uh, IMG M as well. And I should have put, yeah. And microbiome analyst is also web-based microbiome analyst is uh, Canadian made, uh, quite comprehensive actually. And so these range from really like upload data. You don't have like a choice to configure anything through to, I would say microbiome analyst actually has quite a bit where you can change parameters, play around with the data, but in all those cases, you're, you're, you're definitely limited, right? You're sort of, you, it's not bad. Like most of them will do a pretty good job. And then maybe you can extract your tables and then manipulate it after. Uh, I guess for myself, I just like the customality and knowing exactly what's going on behind the scenes, but there are, you know, there's inherently nothing wrong with them. It's just that you're a bit locked into what, what they're doing. The other tool I want to mention here is sort of more local based in that you install the system on your like laptop and the visualization and stuff is done there, uh, is Megan. Megan has been around forever. Like Megan was like one of the very first microbiome tools ever. Uh, and I, I just amazed that they just, just keep pumping out new versions and is still quite widely used. And their system is actually quite, you know, simple and smart in that what they do is they make you or some server do this similarity searching, which is quite intensive. That's the computationally intensive part. So by default, they just say, run your fast queues. Sorry, this is a bit small with diamond against the NCBI database. Those gives you a whole bunch of output files. And then what Megan does is it takes those files and then does all that gap filling, mapping, normalization, and then lets you interact with that data and provides you visualizations in a graphical, uh, local graphical system. Again, very satisfying if you're not maybe as bioinformatics savvy, don't want to get into crazy, you know, R plotting and stuff. Again, I, we don't, I guess I don't use it that much, but like lots of people do. And again, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. So it's something you might want to try out if you're looking for some different visualizations. Is yeah. Megan open source? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the next ones are sort of, uh, I guess, why we're here. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, sir. Yeah. Um, so Galaxy is um, is a bioinformatic open source system that essentially lets people develop tools and then easily make a graphical interface for it that can be hosted locally or in the web. And also the Galaxy system lets you sort of pipe things together a little bit easier. Very cool, very nice. Um, some people then added tools in the Galaxy interfaces. So for example, Chris Huttenhauer has his human pipeline, I believe, still in Galaxy. And there may be others that I'm not aware of in Galaxy. I mean, PyCrust used to be in Galaxy. And I, well, it still is, sorry, but we kind of abandoned a little bit. But anyway, um, yeah. I, so besides, I guess, Huttenhauer's group, they, they, they put a lot of their tools into Galaxy. It's kind of a nice way to take command line systems and make the most minimal sort of graphical way to interact with them. But besides that group, I don't know if there's been a ton of investment in others making their tools available through Galaxy. And the downside, of course, of always the web-based systems, I meant to mention this actually, so thank you, was that this similarity search is really intensive, right? So, you know, you'd upload millions of, like not millions of people, you know, 100 samples of metagenomes where maybe you've done 10 to 100 million reads, you know, if the web server people want to handle that, you're either going to have to make shortcuts or they're going to have a long queue and you're going to wait a long time to get your results or somewhere in between those two. Galaxy sort of lets you help this a little bit, but you're still going to be maybe waiting and limited on where the Galaxy server exists and the resources provided to it. Whereas if you have it local, well, and you have good computing power, then you can be like, well, I, I'll get through this much quicker and faster. It takes forever. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's great. They're like, and a lot of systems will show it this way. They'll be like, yeah, so you upload your metagenome, your one metagenome, <laughs> and then you're like, you can describe it like one. But obviously that's like, we want to operate often comparing more than one or like more than five at a time. And so essentially it just doesn't work quite well. And that's kind of why Megan is a nice system because it disconnects the hardcore similarity searching from, I guess, the, the visualization stuff, which is still somewhat computationally intensive. It's just uh, not as bad. Yeah, in the back, yep. Yep. So and then um so that was three months uh of the course, right? And then it was supposed to build the data into my head. Yeah. And after the three months it still didn't get successful. So I was just thinking like forever, you know, it kept running and running and running and running back to Omega. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean is that because like it's not how I intend to work and it requires like a big memory something or somewhat, right? Because it takes like a of time. Yeah. From the experience from the thread, I've been using that before, right? Yep. Yeah, so I don't know if it's a way, or if it's a general thing, or if you have a good server, or if you have a computational power that can help improve the time, uh, processing time of Megan. So, yes, so just to be clear though, like were you uploading your data to like their Megan server? Yeah, okay, so just to be just super clear, yeah, so I've listed it kind of as these two things. Megan does provide um, this front end part, which then you're gonna wait for. But you can definitely use Megan where you there's instructions on how to do this this searching yourself, which you could use Compute Canda for or any sort of high performance computing you have, and then you can plug those output into Megan separately. Does that make sense? So even though they do provide this, it's fairly straightforward to separate those those two things. Yeah. Whereas you know these systems you can at all. You're just that's your choice. Um, okay, so uh, moving on, I guess, to then, um, uh, where are we at? Yeah, okay, uh, local-based system. So like what we're sort of, I guess, here for to sort of learn how to do it yourself, essentially. And then even with them here, there's a lot of different approaches. Like people have like, I think it's because, you know, there's different similarity search tools, there's different databases, and then there's different normalization. And so it's it's a fun bioinformatics program, like, thing to do is be like, I can make my own and make it better. And like, we did it too. <laughs> it's like, I don't know why it's just like, no one can agree on anything, of course. Um, but essentially what happens is like, you'll see a ton of papers, like where that's like, I can't even keep up with them of how many people have made their pipeline to do like functional annotation and sometimes taxonomic annotation. Here it also that some of them are a little more specialized. Like I know there's like saccharide, which is all about carbohydrate metabolism. Sure. Genes. Absolutely. It's like mostly human associated microbes, right? So you're kind of lowering your possible hit. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. No, absolutely. Yes. So obviously, what happens too is absolutely you get pockets of people they're not satisfied with the type of annotations they're getting back from a particular system. They're like, this is missing all the stuff I care about. And oh, absolutely. And the resolution that they want is much more too. They don't, they're, they're not satisfied with say a keg orth log. Maybe it, maybe that's not as broken down as much. So they're like, oh no, I can break these further into more descriptive categories. And those categories aren't cleanly mapped to UNREF in any way, right? So it has to do with, the functional annotation systems, the databases, right? And often they're tied to that. And my last slide is to talk about those a little bit more, but yeah. So anyway, I, I, I explained a couple of approaches here. Carnelian, it actually uses a Kamer-based approach. Uh, it actually calls genes first. In most of these cases, people aren't calling genes. There's no gene callers. They're just using a BLASTX, which is like a six frame translation of the nucleotide sequence into all possible proteins. Humon 3, we're going to talk about just a little bit more. It's very popular, sort of fast. Uh, it can be used for more than just humans. Um, but yeah, it may not cover everything. And as we'll see, it basically does what I would say the UNREF to MetaPsych pathway mapping thing. Uh, this is not really a plug for myself, but just that I guess, like anyone else, we sort of developed our own pipeline as well within Microbiome Helper. Very similar to, I guess, the backbone a bit of Humon, but although we'll see the slight difference. It's a bit more computationally intensive just because it's we'll see with we'll see with human there's a bit of an approximation step in here uh or you know you can design your own you're 
growing bioinformatic people that, uh, you know, now the basics of what goes into a pipeline, you know, you just get your data, you grab MM62, make a database, start doing stuff, and then normalize a little bit, and bam, you got, you got tables of functions. <laughs> just like, just like that. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's just, uh, I want to explain human here. I think it's kind of neat, uh, and it just ties together maybe an, an, a, a pipeline. So the big thing with pipe with with human is it it incorporates Metaflan, which we talked about yesterday, as the first step. So when you run human, the nice thing is you do get taxa that's predicted by Metaflan plus the functions, and they are tied together. So to be honest, for a lot of applications, I think human would cover you actually really well, or at least as a good starting point. But what's cool, this is the the big thing here is that they have this two sort of mapping, stage mapping process. So what they do is they look at the taxa and they decide with Metaflan what taxa exist. So they, they base their first step on Metaflan predictions. And what they do then is they say, okay, these taxa exist. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna limit our search by searching our reads to just those taxa. And they do that step with bow tie, which we know is, is fast and it's limited to nucleotide and it's limited to very high similarity searches. But the idea is here is that if we know this tax is in here, let's first collect all the reads that collect to these two uh, species, right? They are aware obviously that not all the reads are gonna map to all to, to the, the tax that they've described, either because they didn't identify the species in the first place, or that essentially, you know, lots of these reads could characterize genes that aren't within these species. And so the second stage then is to do that translated search after. So then they run uh, diamond on the leftover reads to UNREF database. So it's really the, the basic pipeline, I would call it, except that they do this first pre-screening. And essentially that helps with um, speeding up the process, primarily speeding up the process. And as we'll get into a little bit, they can then link nicely uh, taxa to functions for the ones that map to their Metaflan species. Does that make sense? Yeah, great. I skipped over all the other steps, <laughs> but after they get to that uh, list of table, they do do a lot of normalization. There's a lot of steps going in. I would say they, I believe it's the tool that has the most things going on to scale their reads to whatever they're calling as pathways. They're doing some gap filling really interestingly. They're definitely using MinPath to remove spurious pathways. It, it's probably the more complicated approach on the steps after this. The uh, output looks something like this, but not colored. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to describe, and I guess I didn't specifically put it here, but the idea of what I could call stratified output versus unstratified. So an unstratified output would be literally just your IDs, your functional ID, with some sort of count. So just ignore this bottom part and it would be just the top part. So you just have gene identifier count, gene identifier count, gene identifier count. That's the most simplest approach. Or you can request stratified output, which has that, but then also has the breakdown of what species contribute this function, have this gene or this pathway. And then if you think back now to their algorithm, like I just told you, this mapping is based on those reads that map to strains from Metaflan. And then this unclassified is basically anything left over that was done at the translated search that, you know, did that hit this pathway, this, this gene, sorry, but didn't come from the Metaflan hit. And then this is just showing that these values then obviously sum up to the value for just the unstratified. So I would suggest usually when you're doing analysis, you would start with unstratified, to be honest, because otherwise it, it, it's pretty complicated here. And then you would look for functions that are maybe different across your groupings. 
And then once you know what functions are of interest, they look different, or maybe ahead of time, you know what functions you're looking for, then you can dive into the stratified output and it provides more information. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so in this case, obviously this is the UNREF 90 IDs. It has a little gene name here. Uh, and then this is the stratified output. The reason I guess uh, we've decided to brew our own versus Human, even though we use Human quite a bit in the lab, like Monica recently ran some metagenomic data. I'm like, no, just, just run it through Human. It's gonna be great, it's good. Is essentially, I'm really interested in personally in these uh, the stratification sort of thing. And we've developed some tools around this. Uh, and although this one looks really nice, the reality is when you dig into the data, mostly from Human, you're gonna get a very high significant proportion being from the unclassified. And so you don't get what I would say is a lot being stratified really well. And that mostly came down to, you know, the restrictions on Metaflan and that first step. And so like with Microbiome Helper, I was not super satisfied. And so now we just take every read and try to map it, one, through Kraken to a taxa, and then two, to MMSeqs to a functional database to improve this, this stratification process. Uh, so then what you would have um, is essentially stratified or unstratified. This is at the UNREF IDs. You can then also map these to, uh, to Metis-like pathways and Human provides functions to do that. So you get basically different types of tables depending on what level you want to look at. Uh, and then this is an example of collapsing to Metis-like pathways. And then you'll also see this options to either get coverage, which I can't remember what exactly the file format's called, or abundance information. And abundance is essentially, you know, actual counts normalized with all that min path fun stuff or coverage is literally just presence absence within that community i don't think coverage is really that super useful to me uh, i prefer this uh, but essentially you're left you know extracting these tables out of the annotation system and then doing stuff with it downstream good any other questions there wonderful uh, okay, uh, and so this just comes back a little bit finally at the very end about the stratified because it's my little been my little pet lately. Um, I'm thinking about you know it's great to dive into functions and their difference, and this is just showing the different things that can come under the hood if you're not looking at stratified output. So what this shows on the top is that you could have a particular function and then you could essentially chart that across your samples, and you can imagine you would have you know, two groups of samples. And this is just for one function, but essentially we don't understand, you know, what's contributing to that. And this is showing essentially different uh, taxa and how they contribute to that function and how it sort of changes their interpretation of the data, right? So in this case, basically what we have is equal sort of representation of taxa to that function. So this, basically these changes look very minimal, not interesting, right? And this is kind of not interesting. It's just the same across across our five samples. But we can have in this case, you know, vastly different taxa contributing to that function, right? And that's a bit more meaningful a bit. It means that maybe this function is important in these samples and it's maintained by different species. You could have the case as well that down here, that this function is just driven primarily by one species, right? It's just one species. And, you know, the abundance of that species dictates, you know, that we have that function a bit, maybe not as interesting. And down here, we could have the case where we have the same amount of functions, but again, it's, you know, a single species almost replacement uh, of that function. And the idea is if you can do that, then you can dig in a bit to the function. So I love it if you've, you know, you've done the understratified analysis, you see what functions are interesting. And then to me, it's great then to dig into the next level and say, is that driven primarily by one species that you already showed is different? Is it driven by a whole bunch of different species? Uh, and the interpretation is, is, is a bit different there. Yep. Okay, then lastly, just a very couple of small plugs. If you're interested in those type of analysis, we've developed a couple of tools. Robin talked about POMS yesterday that takes functional and taxonomic data and looks for 
essentially um, selection of the function over those taxa. If you're interested in literally sort of calculating diversity metrics on these, which sort of hurts my brain to this day, you can do that where you would calculate essentially alpha diversity of a particular function across. You can also calculate beta diversity of how the taxa contribute to a function and look at that across. The diversity is the actual function. Yeah. Yeah. So you can do alpha diversity and beta diversity on functions. We did that over. Or we will do it. Did we do that? It doesn't matter. You will do that, <laughs> uh, which is straightforward to think about. But this is taking a step further and it's saying for a single function, what is the alpha diversity, the taxa contributing to that across samples and across groups? And it's getting at essentially trying to tease apart these four different scenarios. Uh, and so basically, we rolled that into an R package called functdiv. Um, it is, I would say, a little bit hard to interpret, but again, if you get down to a function of really of interest, you can start to then make these metrics for that function, um, which I think is interesting. Uh, and then lastly, we've been developing for, feels like forever, uh, Jarvis. It hasn't actually been that long. Uh, and then this is more focused on visualization of the data. So essentially the idea, of, I think there's a lot to gain from actual visualization of not just either functions or taxa, which we traditionally do, we tend to just do one and then the other, and then we kind of write about the both, is really making those links and trying to visualize it. And so this is just using Sankey plots uh, where you would upload your samples with the taxa and the functions. And so you can upload human output, you could upload essentially data from Microbiome Helper or any way where you just have a stratified output table. Uh, and then you can visualize essentially um, how these pathways are connected to different taxa and then how those different taxa are in our groups. And you have to do some filtering to get it sort of meaningful for sure. Otherwise it's, it's quite large and, and cumbersome. But if you start maybe with either um, trimming down your taxa to interest or functions of interest, you can sort of quickly see what's driving some of that signal. And you'll get a chance to play with it today. Okay, uh, lastly, sorry, I did forget about these two, uh, but it's been addressed a little bit by Robin yesterday, and we talked about it briefly, is there are more specialized gene annotation systems. So human microbiome helper try to just characterize everything at a, at a level for metapsych, and obviously depending on what you're interested in, there's a lot more targeted things you can do. And usually these are, are pretty easy, and the reason why I showed you like brew your own you can do this fairly straightforward. You can say, okay, I'm interested in a database. I'll grab their proteins in a .fFA file. I'll run MMSeqs. And at least maybe I won't stress about all the normalization, but I'll get a sense of, of functions I'm interested in. So there's a virulence factor database, VFTB. Obviously that's of interest if you're comparing more, you know, things that have, where pathogens are of interest. And also uh, antimicrobial resistance interest is huge. And so the CAR database uh, has a database of proteins, plus they have some of their own tools for how to search against it. The carbohydrate metabolizing genes, KZ, is, is quite of interest, especially for people studying things like, uh, like milk metabolism or just any other types of carbohydrate, carbohydrate metabolism, like, you know, you're really into carbon. <laughs> and so uh, it, the resolution of distinguishing essentially different types of carbohydrate metabolism genes is much more greater here than you would get from the UNRF. Uh, we have just sort of ignored the whole virus thing. Uh, and so uh, the functions and taxa that we've talked about a lot are sort of ignoring those. But obviously, if you're interested in phage, uh, prophage, or other types of viruses, you would be doing other types of uh, similarity searches. There's quite a, to a few tools that either pull out reads from your community so that then you can run some sort of a analysis on. So VIR sorters, you know, it, it tries to identify this is likely a, a virus sequence and then you can annotate it after. Um, but there's a lot of tools in that space as well. Uh, and then there's also sometimes people with, you know, on the opposite ends of things, very large databases, bigger than UNRFF, ref. There's always this push to be like, I made the biggest gene catalog database. Like, uh, <laughs> and so someone's always coming out with 
this one's even bigger because we just took more data and we made it bigger and it's awesome, which is cool. Like I, I actually like that, but um, yeah, you'll see these emerge. Sometimes they're a bit focused on environment. Sometimes they're human focused, like where they've said, we've made a new human gene catalog, right? That you can search your reads against. And sure enough, it's very good. Uh, this one's a global microbial gene catalog. Uh, and so the idea here is instead of sort of searching against um, Uniref, you would search against this. And, you know, they have at this version one, they had, you know, 300 million unigenes. That, that's a lot. <laughs> but again, sometimes like the other systems, searching Ansem does let you play a little bit with their system as well. And you can sort of say, the other cool thing is they'll often let you sort of see all oh, this gene has also been found here, especially if it's an environmental sample. Uh, so if you're studying oceans or something and you, you know, this gene seems to be of interest, oh, someone else also found this here. And so that that's really cool, yeah. Okay, so with that, um, that's the end of my, my lecture. Yeah, is there a question? Sure.